Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today, we join the Lord Jesus and his three most intimate disciples for the quintessential mountaintop experience. The event described in today's gospel quite literally took place on a mountain, but it was also of a spiritual intensity that could only leave the witnesses awestruck and breathless. Now Jesus took his inner circle up on the mountain, undoubtedly for the same reason that he often went away to lonely places for prayer. In the gospels we find Jesus constantly seeking the will of his Father. At no point did Jesus ever make decisions in his life or his ministry by saying, What do I want? Rather, what, Father, is your good pleasure? His will was perfectly joined to that of his Father in heaven. Now, there is a lot going on in this scene, but I want to touch on just three things before drawing some application to our own lives. The first is that Jesus was transfigured. What is transfigured? Well, the Merriam-Webster defines transfiguration as a change in form or appearance, or an exalting, glorifying, or a spiritual change. In this instance, the, the change, the glorification, took the form of Jesus' face becoming shining like the sun, and his clothes becoming dazzling white like light. And there's our clue. Light, in the Bible, is often a manifestation of God's glory and presence. And Jesus' radiance here is clearly a display of His own divine glory and majesty, visible to those who are with Him. What happened here is not that Jesus all of a sudden became something that He wasn't, but that His true glory, hidden under the cloak of His humble humanity, was put on full display for the benefit of the disciples, their eyes were opened to see Jesus in all of his majesty. The word which was in the beginning with God, which was God, and which became flesh and dwelt among us, is here revealed in all of his eternal brightness. The second bit from this story is that the whole history of Israel is made present here in this one moment. What do I mean by that? Well, Moses and Elijah show up. And without much background in the Old Testament, we might think, what the heck are they doing there? They're just sort of extraneous characters. What, what role do they play? Well, they're actually really important. Moses, as the great lawgiver, and Elijah, as Israel's greatest prophet, stand as summary representatives of the great <coughs> history of God revealing himself and speaking to his people. They are the high points of the great story of salvation that will reach its fulfillment in the man who is transfigured before them. All that God had revealed in the law and in the prophets points forward to this moment and to this man, Jesus, God's Messiah and King. It's as if they appear to, to spur Jesus on to the fulfillment of, of his mission. Certainly in his humanity, Jesus must have wondered what with the clumsiness of his disciples and the opposition that he faced, he, he may have wondered in his humanity, am I even doing the right thing? Is, is this the direction to go? Well, here is all of Israel's history showing up in this moment of prayer for Christ, saying, yes, this is the Father's will. This is the right path move forward. Third, Peter wanted to stick around. Peter is always one to speak up at any given moment. He always has something to say. And in this moment, he says truthfully that it is good for us to be here. We should make little shelters or booths for Jesus and for Moses and Elijah, the honored guests. What Peter wants to do is sort of prolong the moment. It's a mountaintop experience, right? Who wants that to, to end? So he wants to prolong the moment, perhaps even make it permanent, 
But no sooner than Peter makes this suggestion than the cloud and the voice descend upon the scene. And let's just stop there for a minute. Mountains, dazzling light, clouds, a voice. This whole scene is dripping with the divine presence. The presence of God here is manifested in the forms that would have been familiar to any Jew who was familiar with Israel's scriptures. The voice of the Father, just as he did at Christ's baptism, affirms Jesus' identity as his beloved Son. And he commands his disciples to do one thing. Listen to him. Where we so often would speak up or spring into action, God would often have us simply sit still and listen. What makes this passage significant is not just what happens in it, but the occasion on which we read it. You see, this is the last Sunday before the season of Lent. For Jesus, it was the last great manifestation of his glory before descending the mountain and setting his face toward Jerusalem, where the cross awaited him. In Lent, the church is invited to set our faces toward Jerusalem as well, for a 40-day journey of following our Lord all the way to his cross and his passion. St. Paul makes it clear that we cannot share in the glory of Christ's resurrection if we do not first share in the sufferings of his cross. And this is what Lent is all about. It's like an intense training period, a boot camp, if you will, of the life of self-denial and submitting our will to the will of the Father. So that what St. Paul calls the old man within us is crucified, and the new man in Christ is strengthened and set free. So while we, like Peter, would much prefer to stay on the mountaintop, to keep things upbeat and lively, to have fun, God calls us to the deeper place, to the valley which leads to the cross. But on the other side of that valley is the height of the resurrection. Life and light that never dies, never darkens, and the valley is the only road there, and the cross is the only door that leads to it. So, let us prepare ourselves for the valley. Let us take the opportunity that Lent gives us and carefully consider how we might embrace the church's traditional practices that come to us directly from Jesus of prayer, of fasting, and of almsgiving in order to break ourselves free from slavery to the things of this world so we might better enjoy them for what they are and might be better prepared for the world to come. Let us set our faces toward Jerusalem, toward the cross, together. And to that end, as I conclude, I want to share with you a liturgical change that I'll be starting on Ash Wednesday. I notice everybody perked up. Change. <laughs> is that all I have to do is say change? And everybody perks up. But don't worry, it's not so much a change for you as it is a change uh, for me. And if you're visiting with us today, I apologize for the few moments of insider baseball talk. Uh, but this is, this is important. A liturgy, the way that we worship, is a way for us to sort of dramatize and, and, and enact the reality of the story of God's saving acts in human history. And thus all of our actions and gestures should be reflective of that story. And so beginning on Ash Wednesday, you'll notice a little something different during the celebration of the Eucharist. And that is, you may interpret what I'm doing as turning my back on you during the prayer over the bread and the wine. But please listen carefully, because I'm not actually turning my back on you. I'm actually joining you in turning toward our common object of love and devotion, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because at the end of the day, worship is not primarily about us, it is about Him. For most of the church's history, priests and people faced the altar together when, prayer, when praying, to signal that the priest was nothing more than 
the person who stood at the front of God's people, leading them in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. But it was the common action of all the people together. At some point in the 60s, it was decided that the priest ought to face the people during the Eucharistic prayer because this creates community. I don't know quite what that means, but that was the point, is that it creates community among the people. I say at the risk of offense, nonsense. I think there is nothing more communal, nothing more equalizing, nothing more uniting than a priest and his flock facing toward Jerusalem together, as it were. A priest and his flock together turned toward Christ in repentance, in love, and in faith. Toward Calvary, toward the crucified and risen Lord who feeds us with his precious body and blood. And at the risk of being flippant, I don't think there's anything about seeing the cooking demonstration at the altar which suggests community, any more so than having us all face the same way together when we pray. If anything, it makes the congregation turn inward upon itself, or it makes the priest the center of attention. But really, there can only be one star of this show, one center of attention. And together, we will set our faces with him toward the cross of Calvary, that we may behold the glory of his empty tomb and his smashing of the gates of hell by destroying death by death itself. Now, I understand some of you will be comfortable, uncomfortable with this change, and that's to be expected. But I only ask that you use the little bit of discomfort as grist for the mill of prayer and spiritual growth during this holy season we're about to enter. At the end of the day, it makes perfect sense. When we dialogue with each other during the liturgy, we face one another. But when we pray together, or when I pray on your behalf, we set our faces together toward the one to whom we speak. The one who calls us to the glories of the Mount of Transfiguration in order to strengthen us for the valley below. The valley that leads to the cross. And for the blissful life of resurrection that inevitably comes to those who pass through it with repentance, hope, and faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.